Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I will be joined by John Paul Mason and Declan McConville. There's been a slight technical glitch at this end, but I don't want to be late for the Axon Bulletin. So we will start right now and I'll be taking your comments until the other guys join us. Today we're going to be talking about the comments made by our ex-manager Brendan Rodgers yesterday, which I found very interesting in relation to transfer autonomy. Uh, We'll also be talking about Celtic Shared. We had an extra bulletin earlier on today. The comments by Stephen McGowan around Ivan Tony and uh, also Lenny now that the dust has settled we'll also be looking forward to the first game under John Kennedy um, I'm going to welcome JP Mason to the stream John Paul Mason how on earth are you? Yeah I'm, uh, I'm okay man I, it was a weird day yesterday um, weird weird feeling um, after all this chat about it it's just uh I don't. I didn't. I didn't get any sense of joy from it. Uh, I didn't get any sense of. I, it was just a very numbing feeling, like a, a kind of someone that you've associated with the club for so long to leave in this fashion was was just quite strange. And I, I get that there's people that are all up in arms and Lennon's this and Lennon's that, and you know, never darken our door again at Celtic Park, and oh, like that's absolute crazy talk for me. I think that's. Wild, wild talk. Um, first comment coming through, Helen McCallum, after this season, the fans deserve a big name manager. I thought you were going to say after this season, the fans deserve Axon to be on time. Now, we, uh, were about, we were about a minute late, but as I say, just as I was going live, my computer crashed. So again, it's these interesting gremlins that creep in and out JP throughout the season. I think the point you make is very interesting because when I got home uh, last night, after obviously speaking about the Neil Lennon situation all day and speaking about Neil Lennon for most of the year, in actual fact, on a Celtic state of mind, on a daily basis, um, I sat down, time to reflect, JP, and I'm speaking to the missus who, when watching the news, was saying, I feel sorry for him. Now, I, I absolutely get that. Now, we also yesterday got a wee bit of feedback from the opening dispatches of our nine o'clock bulletin that involved Declan McConville and Anthony Haggerty, where it was, let's not start revising the situation. Lenny had to go. I don't think any of us are revising it. It's just that here's a man who's been a part of Celtic Football Club for so long, JP. We watched him as a player. We've experienced the highs. We've now experienced the lows. Um, There was no great celebration. There was no feeling like that. I went home and it was a disappointment, not that Neil Lennon had left, but that he wasn't able to see this through in many ways. And, yeah. you know, that that had become so evident early on in the season. And we will be talking about Lenny today, of course we will, in this week of all weeks. But we'll also be looking ahead, and we'll be looking ahead not only to the next game, but what else is going to be facing Celtic fans in the future? I called it yesterday a rebuild. And some people said, you know, how could it be the biggest rebuild uh, of your lifetime? Surely the Fergus McCann rebuild was a bigger one. Of course it was, in terms of the club. I just think in terms of personnel, though, JP, going into the summer, when you think Scott Brown could be gone, the the club captain, of course, four loanees, whether or not you would keep any of them, I don't know. That's a a completely different discussion. Some people reckon El Yunusi would be worth keeping. Um, I don't think any of the other three, although John Joe Kenny, I don't think he's, um, you know, set the heather alight, but he's been competent enough. However, if you try to sign a player like that, the wages would be big, the transfer fee would be large. So we're going to lose four loanees potentially. Then you have the question, again, this appeared in the press yesterday around the agitators that Neil Lennon had been talking about after the Ferenc Varos game, apparently being Ayer, Edward and Cham. So, you know, you could maybe add into the mix, Ryan Christie perhaps might be looking to move as well. Um, so, yeah, a massive rebuilding job. And just while we're talking, Declan McConville has joined the stream as well. Welcome to the show, Declan. How are you? Good afternoon, guys. Sorry, I was having some technical difficulties there. 
but I'm back. We're all good. The, these things happen, Declan. And um, yesterday, actually, I was talking about what we used to do when, you know, in the early days of the bulletin, when it was just me sometimes, and I would just come on and talk to the comments, and you could do it in an hour. You needed plenty of juice and water, but you could you could get through an hour quite easily. There was always topics of conversation. But, um, you know, just now that the dust has settled, I spoke to you yesterday morning at nine o'clock, Declan, JP and I were talking about a sense, a bit of a sense of sadness, obviously. Uh, not necessarily because Neil Lennon is no longer here, because that's what I wanted. I wanted a change. But the fact that, you know, he couldn't actually see this through. Uh, unfinished business, he couldn't see it through. What's your thoughts now, 24 hours later? I think, Paul, they kind of, everybody wanted Neil Lennon to be successful as Celtic manager. I always go back to May 2020 when everybody was united behind Neil Lennon and going for 10 in a row. It's not worked out and Neil Lennon departing the club is a sign of the club feeling because it's not went well for us this season. So any Celtic manager leaving, whether it's Neil Lennon, Tony Mowbray, Brendan Rodgers, means that the club aren't doing something right, which is always a sadness for any Celtic fan. So under the circumstances, it's sad that he's not been able to to hold out this season um, we've obviously got John Kennedy coming in there's a lot of good chat out there from Brendan Rogers, from Damien Duff and Brayton John as a, a top coach we'll see how that goes in the last eight games but there's a tinge of sadness because Neil Lennon's been part of Celtic history you you know you can't scrub him out the history books he will always be part of Celtic history so it's a big character of the club no longer probably going to be connected with the club in any capacity so yeah as I say, a Celtic manager leaving a club is always going to be met with sadness, but it's time to move on and, and start again. Now, I do normally ask this. Uh, I normally ask JP about the Celtic jersey over his shoulder, but I also see the appearance of a certain Anthony Haggerty's book <laughs> as well. Yeah. You're just plugging you're just plugging products. Uh, tell us about the book. Obviously, Tony has been what has been called a cult addition to Axom, uh, and I think I think that would be right. Well, I mean, I've only got to know him of late and uh, he uh, he sent me a, a really uh, complimentary message about my uh, <laughs> contribution towards Axon, which I was, was you know, chuffed with. Uh, and then we've we've exchanged quite a few messages about Celtic and uh, I've just bought that book. Um, it arrived yesterday, so I've not actually uh, dug in yet, but I'm looking forward to it because if, if the book's half as good as some of his patter and his messages and, you know, some of the things that he's seen and done, then uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I seen a message yesterday because obviously not everything you read is positive, is it? Uh, and I seen a message yesterday that Anthony forwarded to me uh, because someone was giving him stick for previously having the audacity to work as a journalist in Scotland. <laughs> and yeah, you know, on the bottom of your screen, you've got another one: up and coming journalist Declan McConville. You know. Journalism in this country, um, is it unique? I don't know. I've only ever lived in Scotland. But certainly in, in respect to the football, we all have our, our views on it. And I remember Anthony Haggerty, the first time I met Anthony, he came along, it was a, a press call that we did in Glasgow and there was a couple of ex celts there. I think it was Simon Donnelly and Tom Boyd. And um, I remember having a right good chat with them along with Alison McConnell and Stephen McGowan. They were all there and various others were there. Um, the funny thing was, Andrew Smith turned up, but he, he turned up on his bike, like bicycle, <laughs> with full regalia. They were all turning up in their motors and then he turned up. He was a former Celtic View editor. And the crack that everybody was having around, even though they were all from kind of rival titles, they were all having a bit of crack over a cup of tea and, and a chat after the interview. And as Anthony left the building, he says, you see, we're not all bad guys. And that stuck with me. So we kind of stayed in touch through email. And then obviously that resulted in uh, Tony being involved in a, a great part of the Axon team. But it has gone down a storm. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt about it. But I've got to apologise because I was asked last night on another show about the Neil Lennon situation. And I quoted Tony and I didn't credit him for it. So I stole his I quote. I Did you see that. it? Yeah, I saw that. I said, some, someone said in the podcast, so I was like, oh, I know who that was. It was Tony. <laughs> so big apologies to Tony. It was your quote. I did steal it. And it was that Neil Lennon was an analogue manager in a digital football world. Uh, and I've been thinking about that as well. Do you think that is the case, JP? Is there a place in football for Neil Lennon? For his sake, I would certainly like to think so. Uh, you know, 
going by the the the, the teams he's managed out with Celtic, um, it doesn't exactly you know mean to say that there's going to be a host of uh, of, of of clubs lining up to take him on. Um, I, I don't know what his next move will be. Uh, I hope that it's in football, and I hope that he has a continues to have a, a successful career because this season aside, as a manager, um, okay, the Bolton thing didn't work out, but he did well at Hibs up until a point. Um, I think, see, with regards to the analog manager in a digital world, um, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of people flinging blame around and blaming him for us, you know, losing out this season and all the rest of it, but. It's something that's came to my my thinking, and it was kind of mentioned in the the the, the previous uh, uh, show today with the Celtic Shared guys, which I listened to, which was excellent and very informative. And they said something about, "Well, we are just starting. The Green Brigade are just starting the car. You know, we're not dri- we're not driving it. You know." And my th- thought about that with Lennon was that um, Lennon's hands have been on the tiller, but um, Peter Lowell set the coordinates. You know, you, you've mentioned the Celtic shared and I've got it written down here and I'm going to have a, a wee discussion with you guys on that because the whole idea around that, JP, was basically just to spread the word, um, to try and put it out there as to what they're, they're trying to do. And I think it was uh, it was well received in the main. I think what happened was that the very fact that the two guys that were on, Paul and Martin, are involved in the Green Brigade, and we know that the Green Brigade don't generally do interviews and and that kind of thing. So it was great to have them on, but um, in order to protect their identity, let's let's be totally honest about this. And on it, and um, as a, a means of protecting their identity, because you know the Green Brigade are seen as a group of ultras. So let's let's take a wee step back into how they are perceived, not just by society, but by the pillars that be in Scotland. We were talking about Scottish issues earlier in, in respect to the media. There are definitely Scottish issues in terms of policing. Um, we know that, and, and uh, we'll talk a wee, a wee bit about that. So I know for a fact that if they were to have appeared as Declan McConville of the Green Brigade, and I'm not throwing you under the bus here, Dec, I'm not claiming you're part of the Green Brigade, uh, and he was sitting there on his couch uh, revealing his identity, that pin, that, that mugshot, that mugshot would have ended up on a police document, an intelligence document. The police would have been all over that. Um, and basically that would have fed their own agenda. I'm talking about the police agenda in relation to the Green Brigade. So... That is the reason why they didn't appear on the screen. Um, a few people were making a joke that it was actually Kieran Tierney in disguise, and you know that'd have been good. I've asked Kieran to appear on Axon, but he's ignoring me. Um, mm. But that—that that was the reason they didn't appear. Um, and that is—that sounds brutal, but that is the way it is in this country. Had they appeared on the podcast revealing their full identities within minutes the police would have had that profile shot in an intelligence document. It would have been shared throughout the intelligence network within police forces all over the country. And that's the reason they weren't they weren't shown. Now, is that a sad indictment to society in this day and age? To a degree, I, I would say it is. But you've got to protect these guys. If they're willing to come on to Axom and speak about something that, that wasn't about the Green Brigade, uh, but speak about something else. We've got to respect that, you know. So that that was the reason behind it. Um, Declan, did you catch the the show earlier on today? I was doing junior work, so I never caught it. But I've been following them on Twitter um, and seeing what they've been getting up to. And by all means, you know, there's nothing wrong with Celtic fans uniting um, together. We are stronger. I so saw that, that phrase banded about a bit, and it is. It's true, you know. Celtic fan base is wide, it's diverse, and the more people that come together, the more likely you are to achieve change. Yeah, definitely. I keep going back, JP, to the bad old days, uh, but basically, there's there's a lot of similarities in terms of right. Here is a disenfranchised, here is a disillusioned fan base. They want change. Now, yeah, different types of change, of course. We want to change back then to save the very future of our club. The club were facing down a barrel of a, of a gun at that time. This time round, we want change so that we can progress as a club. You know, we want to be a progressive club. We want to have um, a, a stature throughout Europe, something that we've not had for some time now. Uh, so, yeah, the, the circumstances are different, but... The main thing is we want that change. So in order for that to happen, we need to be organised, JP, don't we? And the Celtic support this season, what's come to light is it's been fractured. 
And that, again, is something that saddens me. So I think that Celtic Shared is a great way of trying to bring everything under one umbrella. I, I agree, yeah. Um, I think even you see in the way that people have reacted to to the manager leaving shows you the kind of fracture in the in the support and the way that you know some people are uh, looking back fondly, some people are you know being really <laughs> really aggressive in their attacks on Neil Lennon. And, and there was a few things that I put up a tweet with a couple of pictures. One of them celebrating the CIS Cup victory in two thousand and one with the the yellow kit on, and he's got the white hair. And this a big, big, uh, big smile, and he's he's built like the side of a fiver, which obviously isn't the case anymore. No disrespect uh, <laughs> to Neil Lennon on that, but um, oh, it happens to us all. <laughs> but uh, and then the, the, the second picture was a picture of him with his head in his hands, and I said, "It saddens me that a, a generation of Celtic fans will only really remember one of these pictures of Neil Lennon because you know they've, this is what they've lived through. They didn't live through." You know they, they they don't have the we have the years on them unfortunately uh, for us that we can remember you know Neil Wenning as a successful player um, for Celtic so it, it saddens me that 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 is the the case and that and that causes that causes a fracture because you've got like the older generation like us who do remember him as a player and struggle with this attack on him as a person because mm. ultimately I think he just wanted Celtic to do well and I genuinely think he thought he could change it and at the tipping point. Uh, for for the tipping hit point for him probably was the Julian injury going into the Ibrox game and then Dubai unraveling after that and then I think somebody mentioned that somewhere that it probably dawned on him when Hibs equalised in that last minute when he's sitting at home self isolating because of a pandemic when Hibs equalised in that game he's just like oh that's it that's it out the window then we were we were we were going to get those three points. In a game where no one gave us a chance with a shadow side, and then they steal the goal in the last minute, equalise, and it just puts a pin, a pin in that balloon that was starting to inflate a wee bit. See, the big thing we will constantly um, go into the nitty gritty of what went wrong this season. We'll look back in happier times uh, and talk about opportunities missed as well, JP. But I think that particular game you're talking about, for me, um, really epitomises everything about Celtic under Neil Lennon this season. Even though Neil Lennon wasn't in the ground, I think he was just as effective. Mm -hmm. I think he was just as effective. I think that's been the problem. I don't think he's been effective enough as a manager on the sidelines during a game, making changes in-game. And what I mean by that, you look at some of the really poor results from our perspective that we've had this season. St Mirren beat us at the end of January for the first time at Celtic Park in 31 years. And if you think back to that game, and it's not I, I'm not trying to sell myself as a body language expert. Anyone with a set of eyes would know. Jimmy Goodwin kicked every single ball. He communicated for 90 minutes with his, his team. And by the way, the team members seemed to buy into whatever it was Jimmy Goodwin was, was imparting over to them. I think Jimmy Goodwin's got a, a bright future in the game I think he's going to go down a similar path to Jack Cross he already has done um, but again David Martindale so this old thing about old school manager you know it flies in the face of that a wee bit because I think Martindale in many ways could be described as as someone who is similar in style because you speak to or you hear Livingston players speaking about the way that Martindale goes about his business and of course we interviewed David Martindale on one of our other shows fairly recently and He's going to be lining up as a, a cup final manager this weekend. Something that our manager isn't going to do, um, which is which is frustrating as anything. But when you're looking at that and you're looking at Neil Lennon and the way that he was this season, I don't think he deliberately changed. I don't think that you know we we heard the story that uh, from guys who had played with him or played under him that he had mellowed second time round he wasn't as in involved he wasn't as engaged with his players throughout because we all remember the, the screaming and the bawling and Neil Lennon first time round kicking water bottles up in Inverness and all that kind of thing we didn't see much of that um, this season but um, I think what happened this season is that there was a realisation slowly uh, by Neil Lennon that he couldn't affect the performances of the players he had at his disposal the same way he could first time round. And the example I used last night when I was chatting about it was, you imagine first time round Neil Lennon imparting some kind of message to Tony Stokes at half time in a game. 
Uh, and this time round, Neil Lennon doing the exact same in the same style to Odson Edward. Do you think you would get the same result from the Tony Stokes as you would from Edward? You simply wouldn't, would you? No, I mean you've, you've seen that you've seen that in, in, in clear evidence with the performances of of Fods and Edward in, in this season, um, where he's for the majority of it he's not really been anywhere near the levels that we know that he can be at. But yeah, he's still got the goal return. It says a lot for him as a as a player that even a uh, half functioning odds and Edward uh, can provide a return of twenty goals or whatever it is he's got just now. But it should be so much more. Now, what I will do is, before we move on to the, the upcoming game, uh, a new, can we even call it a new era yet? I don't think we can. Uh, the first game under John Kennedy. Now, again, similarities between this and when Neil Lennon stepped in first time round. I think it was nine games, wasn't it, JP? Declan, can you remember nine games? Lasted I, I, nine I think, games of that season? I think so. I think Tony gets sacked around that 30 game, Matthew. Yeah. Yep. So there was nine games to go uh, when Lenny came in. Uh, we still had one eye on the Scottish Cup. Obviously, we know what happened against Ross County. We won't have the opportunity to speak, play in the Scottish Cup this time round. But we've heard all the quotes. As Declan said at the top of the show, uh, we've heard all the quotes in relation to how highly rated John Kennedy is. My feeling on that is that he was part of the problem. You know, because he's dealing with the players day in, day out. He's imparting his own messages to those players. We've seen Strachan trying to do the same to Griffiths last week. I don't know how much uh, Griffiths was taken in. So what I'm going to ask you is, can you see any difference this weekend, Declan, when Celtic take the field under the same coach, under the same analyst, you know, under the same assistant manager who's now just stepped up to the, the manager's chair? Can you see any difference being made to the performance? Personally, no, I don't think so. Um, because again, you know, as a collective, it's Neil Lennon, John Kennedy, and Gavin Slacken. One person out of that team is no longer there, the figurehead of that team. Um, but at times, again, we, we, you were talking about body language, Paul. We've saw some very peculiar body language from John Kennedy this season, mm. shrugging his shoulders, standing with his arms folded. Um, but again, no, I think John Kennedy will want to show his worth. In these last eight games, uh, you know, we've spoken, Tony was talking yesterday about if John Kennedy was so good a coach and he was trusted so much, why did they not get the job in February 2019? So, you know, John, we all know John's a decent coach, going in quotes, um, but whether there'll be a big difference in performance, I don't think so, because it's nothing that's going to be really, it's not freshen up, it's no new ideas coming in, it's still the same two guys sitting there. And even under Gavin Stacker in those two games yes Neil Lennon was probably affecting the outcome on the park from his living room but um, in those two games you never saw really anything different under Gavin Stracken. so basically went for the three of them and getting to see what they're all like in the dugout and I don't think there'll be much of a difference but I hope there is and I would like us to obviously win on Saturday what about yourself, JP? Um, there's been a few people coming in to say, what if he wins the next eight games and he beats Rangers twice and he restores a tiny bit of kind of pride in the Celtic side? What if? I don't actually think that's going to make a blind bit of difference as to what the, the greater plan is that's, that's currently in place and it's something I'm going to talk to you about in relation to a director of football and a coach coming in. But um, what about yourself? Do you think there will be, we, we hear it all the time, the new manager bounce, you know, you look at the impact that Yogi had when he went to Ross County for example looks for me to have saved him from relegation I know there's a, quite a lot of games to go but he's got the momentum going there um, if he can just beat the sides in the bottom six which he will be facing uh, obviously after the split do you think there'll be any difference in the approach of the players the tempo you know that we've been so critical of I, I would be personally I would be disgusted if there was and I'm going to be quite honest about that because if there is a immediate reaction to to Neil Lennon leaving his manager, and all of a sudden they start playing, you know, with their tails up, and I mean that means that they they were playing, they were not playing for the manager, that which in turn means they weren't playing for the football club. Yeah. And uh, I was having a, a spat with somebody on online uh, where I said, you know, I don't really care about who the manager is or anything else that's going on with the football club. When those players are playing on the pitch, it's about the 11 players that are playing on the pitch and what they do. I don't really care about anything else to do with Celtic at that point. We know, you know, anything to do with the manager or anything like that, it's, it's what they do at that moment in time. And I, I said this back in sort of November, December, you know, where I was 
concerned about the, where the, where we were going and the players that were uh, there. And I basically said, you know, if Neil Lennon was to go now, it's still going to be the same players that are there when he goes. It's, and, and, and it's up to them to, to do something about this situation. And I think a number of things have conspired against uh, the team and Neil Lennon. But if all of a sudden, with Neil Lennon gone, they were to start playing out of their skin, I would I would I would feel I'd be furious because we've had to sit and watch this, you know, dross, and it has been mostly dross this season, you know, um, and to, to suddenly you know find form uh, with with Neil Wenning out of the door, I, I would I would leave a really bad taste in my mouth, and I wouldn't shed any tears about most of those players leaving in the summer if that was to be the case. What you're saying, spot on. JP, because what they're doing is they're representing the club, which means they're representing us as fans, yeah. as as supporters. Um, so you don't switch it all on and off like a switch. You know, you just don't do that once you pull on the hoops. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, after the announcement, there was a few quotes appeared on on the broadcast media in relation to uh, what Dermot Desmond was saying about it, and he spoke about Neil Lennon being a legend, etc. Um, then, you know, we're talking about and whatever guys, a director of football is what we generally call it, all right? Um, and you look at, when was the last time we had anybody in a in a position quite like that? And it was Kenny Dalgleish, wasn't it? You know, Kenny mm-hmm. Dalgleish, uh, someone's going to shout, it was Peter Lowell. It was Kenny Dalgleish, right? So he had this, uh, and it wasn't even called a director of football back then, I forget the terminology, but he had that role, and Barnes was the head coach. And I was talking about this yesterday. So the first head coach that Celtic ever appointed, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, anybody out there, was Vim Janssen. He was the first head coach. Everybody before then had been a manager. And this was Fergus McCann, obviously, looking at Celtic from a different perspective, a a fresh approach, looking at how we could do things better. So even back then, Fergus McCann, you know, in terms of the way that he was thinking, he was ahead of his time, and we can say that now. But we're kind of of the view that there needs to be a structural change. We've seen the CEO situation being clarified. We know that Dominic Mackay is coming in. And it's a, a kind of generally um, accepted view that Celtic will be appointing, a direct, let's call it a director of football, a buffer between the guy that's dealing with the team on a day-to-day basis and obviously the board, the CEO. And this director of football, the name that I've seen, uh, that I find quite interesting, coming up time and time again is Fergal Harkin. So let, let's say that the next move that happens now that John Kennedy is the, the temporary man in charge, the interim boss, is that the director of football is announced. And let's say that it is someone like Fergal Harkin. I am going to put something out to you at this moment in time as something that might be a possibility. Let's say that all these odds and all these names, all the managers that you and I and everybody else is speaking about, it's not going to be any of them. Let's say that the director of football will have a completely different role than what Celtic have ever had in the past. And a lot of that will be recruitment. And what will be happening under him, let's say, will be someone who maybe isn't um, a manager per se, but someone who is a a hugely respected member uh, of an academy. So I've seen quite a few names mentioned in relation to head coach positions, not a manager, a head coach who works in conjunction with the director of football, who will obviously be coaching the players on a day-to-day basis. The players, he'll have an input into recruitment, but actually a director of football will be driving that side of the football department. And the head coach won't be what you and I would normally associate with Celtic. So I think the only time we've gone down something slightly similar, a wee bit left field, was when we brought in Ronnie Dyla. Now, I know he wasn't the head coach of an academy, when we brought him in. But he was in discussions with Man City uh, around running their academy. That's the level that Man City saw someone like Ronnie Dyla when we appointed him as a manager. And we all know the situation in relation to him uh, you know, being approached initially as an assistant manager to Neil Lennon and then as an assistant manager to Roy Keane. And eventually, because uh, it didn't go the way that we expected it, he became the manager. So 
I am now looking at this situation and it will all become clear. I think a fresh approach will be made by the club and it will be a director of football who will be assisted by and who will work with someone potentially that he has got a close association with. Someone that he's already worked maybe even at a football club with. So the managers that we're all talking about and we love the idea, don't we, of Rafa Benitez. I've spoken about Martinez and every time I speak about him I get laughed at and scoffed at. What if it's none of these guys? What if it's someone who doesn't have any profile whatsoever uh, beyond youth football and they're the head of an academy somewhere at under-23 level? Declan McConville, I'm going to throw it over to you. Would there be a sense of disappointment? Are we now in a scenario where we are looking for high profile for profile's sake because of how we're feeling, the disappointment? Uh, and something this left field, something this different and fresh might not be a popular move for the club at this time. I don't know, I've been speaking a lot about selling season tickets and I think an elite manager bringing in, you know, the guys that we've mentioned, Jeredi Howes, Benitez, Martinez, would sell season tickets. Whether going in the direction of a director of football with a, an assistant manager at another club, a, a guy that's head of a youth academy coming in, would that sell season tickets? Personally, I, I don't think it would. Would it be something I'd be interested in watching and going along to see? Yes. But I think from the club's perspective, they need to get fans back on side. And I think that's only going to come in the form of appointing a high-caliber, well-known manager. Um, as much as that would be interesting and it'd be something progressive, fresh, new, I don't think it would sell season tickets, Paul. So I think we need to go for something, somebody that's well-known in the game and uh, something that will sell season tickets. Now, I didn't line that question up to get that answer, Declan, but I expected that because if someone asked me that question a week ago, I'd have given the same answer and I think a lot of people would still give the same answer. So, on the one hand, JP, we're talking about uh, a necessity to give us uh, some kind of vision. I mean, we've just had a discussion there with Celtic Shared and we'll talk about that. But we've we've been criticising the club all year about we don't know where we're going from one day to the next, never mind a three-year plan, five, seven-year plan. When was the last time we had that plan? Was it under Fergus McCann? Potentially. And that, a big part of that in the last decade has been because we have had total domination of the Scottish game and it was all about just, you know, staying that step ahead of the competition and we're now criticising the club for that. So on the one hand, we're saying we want something a wee bit more long term. We don't want to be living year by year just winning the league. But when presented with something that is a, a far more long-term view, bringing in a director of football who may have worked, let's say, who's, who's Fergal Harkin worked with at Manchester City? Is there somebody who's working within the youth development, within the academy, who you know, is a shining star at that level in terms of progressing youth, which is something Celtic need to look at post-Brexit and post-Covid, and someone who is all about developing players, right? Because we keep saying that, don't we, on this podcast, that's what we need, someone who can do that. But is that person an elite manager, or is it someone who is known to be astute, in that area of football and he's known by the man who comes in as a director of football so it really is a dilemma do we go for the let's get a big man in a big name in high profile sell the season tickets or do we go for the long term vision can you have it all that's a very very loaded and uh, weighted question uh, and as you were asking it I was sort of I was swaying one way, like thinking, right, I would I would actually be into that, you know, um, especially if it was if the person had been properly scouted and, you know, everything about their character had been assessed and, you know, the, the, their temperament, all of that, you know, um, would they be able to cope with it? And, you know, I, I, I would be into that as an idea, but I think back to, and maybe this is a wrong thing to think about, but I think back to what happened when we stopped uh, Rangers at the time. They were Rangers winning 10 in a row, um, 1998. And what they did to counter our resurgence at that point was to go out and sign an internationally proven coach and Dick Advocate, you know, massively respected, had managed the international side at that point, I think, or maybe hadn't, had, had he? He might have managed the Netherlands at that point. I don't know. I can't remember. But he certainly had success with, um, I think it was, was it PSV Eindhoven he'd been at? Um, I, I, 
forgive me for not knowing my uh, Dick Advocate sort of uh, credentials, but certainly at that point they brought in someone who was an absolutely proven coach and obviously they were spending ridiculous amounts of money as well, 12 million on flow and things like that. Um, so that helped him in his case. But I don't know, I just think at this point in time, at this juncture, as Tony pointed out in another podcast, what has been the most successful moments in recent Celtic history? It's been a, a manager that's been, uh, res- you know, had success of a certain level uh, and given full control over the club. Um, as I as 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 I watched that Three Kings documentary, which is amazing, uh, the Johnny Owen one, mm. and that is what all those managers had at their clubs was full control, and Not- you know. Brendan Rodgers just said it, and I hate to mention him, but Brendan Rodgers mentioned it yesterday in a press conference. That is what a manager needs to have. He needs to have control over the players and be accountable for those players coming in. Now, we will talk about that interview because I found it very interesting. It all links into this discussion we're having. Uh, but yeah, a big shout out to, to Johnny Owen. He's obviously a friend of a Celtic State of Mind, having appeared on the podcast twice. Uh, he helped us out with the charity weekend or back in December as well, did Johnny. But I remember speaking about um, when I was working with Luke Massey, who uh, was the director of the Nearly Mocking documentary, which you can still watch free of charge on YouTube or on Amazon Prime. Uh, if you do watch it, remember and give it a 10 star, by the way, because it's only sitting at 7.4. Um, and we were talking about other plans, other plans for other documentaries. Of course, we had worked for probably a full year on the Quality Street Gang documentary, which has never been released. And we've got loads and loads of interviews, which are still in the vault. Um, whether or not that will ever be finished, I don't know. But we spoke about Jock Steen, and I says to him, if you ever make a Jockstein documentary, you need to call it Control. And I'm obviously thinking of the Joy Division yeah. links and, and soundtrack opportunities as well, JP. Mm-hmm. But that word Control uh, is so important to exactly what you've said there. And what happens, and this goes back to Anthony Haggerty, so I'm going to give him credit this time for using what he said. Um, Anthony Haggerty spoke about what happens when you give the manager autonomy. What happens when you give him that control? Well, you get success. You know, if it's the right manager, and yeah. in Celtic's case, when you look through the history, when we've ever done that, it's always worked. And it's only worked to a point with Martin O'Neill and Brennan Rogers because there came a point where I think the manager's ambitions no longer match the board's ambitions. I think that there comes that point, doesn't there, where the manager wants to continue to push the envelope and the board are not willing to do it especially if they can't back it up with this is what I've done in Europe for you guys and I need this to take it a step forward. I don't think Rodgers was ever at that stage. He didn't have that bargaining power, JP, with Celtic, where he could say, look what I've done in Europe. If you give me this, I can take us there. He never had that. And I think where, when O'Neill got to the stage where he had taken us to a final, he was wanting, obviously, to progress in the Champions League, being a European Cup winner himself as a player. And John Robertson, his assistant, also had uh, tasted European success. At that point, his European stock amongst the board wasn't so high because we had failed um, in in the preceding seasons to to progress and kick on from the the UEFA Cup final. So I think both managers found themselves in a position, even though O'Neill had far more success as a manager. Um, Now, when we speak about Rodgers then, Again, going down to perceptions, going down to how Fergus McCann is now viewed now compared to how he was viewed when he was booed, um, unfurling the flag. Uh, how Neil Lennon is viewed at this moment in time compared to how he's going to be viewed in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Another man who obviously um, has a certain reputation among Celtic fans is Brendan Rodgers. So we've spoken about Brendan Rodgers and the comments he made yesterday. And one thing is about Brennan Rogers, when he speaks, he's very controlled, going back to that control that you used there, JP. Uh, I think generally he's very complimentary about just about everybody he speaks about. So he's talking about Neil Lennon in glowing terms. But when he was spoke, uh, spoken to about what Celtic do next, it was very interesting that he touched on the fact that the manager needs to have that control. He needs to have the control over the players coming in. So... Declan, when you look at any change in the structure, because obviously Peter Lowell, who's had a big part in that control, the controlling aspect to the Celtic football department, he's no longer going to be there. There's going to be a fresh approach from Dominic Mackay, potentially a director of football. Can you see 
us having that level of control in the football side of things? Um, is that the way forward? Is that going to happen with the new regime? I think it needs to happen to an extent. I mean, by no means give the manager an open checkbook and just say, go and spend out with your means, you know, to an extent. But if you go back to Brendan Rodgers, and I hate to go back in this because I think we're all sick of hearing about John McGinn, but there was a situation of a player that was we were able to get, he was ready to sign, and we waited and waited and waited when the manager wanted him. And inevitably, we look back on it and think, there's a point when Brendan Rodgers probably thought, what is the point here? Because I'm, I'm not getting players that I want in the door. Instead, you end up getting guys through like Yusuf Malumbu, Izagiri and Daniel Arzani that window. So, you know, I think what he was saying yesterday was really, really interesting. He said it was critical for the manager to have that control. And I think if we are going to move forward, you know, the way Peter's dabbled in football department um, decisions, we've heard stories that Marion Shred turning up at Lennox Town and Brendan Rodgers going, who's he? I think there's even been guys probably in the door last summer at Celtic um, that Neil Lennon probably didn't want. The goalkeeper probably been one of them. We saw yesterday Stephen McGowan saying that Ivan Tony was in the building and we didn't sign him. It said we get Albina Yeti. Again, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I think it is critical for the manager to get who he wants because as Brendan said yesterday, he's in charge of results. The buck will stop with him, so it's important that the manager gets who he wants that when the decision comes and the fans make their decision, he is 100% responsible and it's not a blame game of somebody else. Going back to a point JP made earlier, Dick Advocat had indeed been manager of PSV and the Netherlands when he took over at Ibrox all those years ago. Um, but when Declan was talking there about you know the Marion's Fed situation, um, I'm sure there's been quite a few players under the, the Brennan Rogers tenure that came into that category. Why else would you pay over a million quid for Marvin Comper and play him for 60 minutes? I mean, at that time, we're all scratching our heads. Why is this guy not playing? Because he's a German internationalist. We've spent over a million quid for him, and he simply wasn't playing. And I think that was a message from the manager at that time. This this boy's no my player. You know, because you wouldn't spend that kind of money for 60 minutes. You just wouldn't do it. Now, in respect to that, though, you know, go back to Gordon Strachan's time and the Paddy McCourt story. So to Paddy McCourt, Paddy McCourt signed for Celtic and, and he wasn't a Gordon Strachan signing. Now, I know it, it was a nominal fee that was paid when he came to Celtic from Derry, but Gordon Strachan didn't even know who he was. And Paddy McCourt tells the story that he, you know, he turns up for training, he says, and I look bad enough because he had the old uh, the hairdo and all that. And that's Paddy's words. I'm not saying that. I quite liked his hair. But Gordon Strachan quite clearly didn't know who he was. And he, and he admitted that this, the the actual transfer was done because Dermot Desmond's friend seen him playing for Derry City and basically told Peter Lowell to go and sign him. And what happened there was he was down at West Brom just about to sign for Tony Mowbray. And he got the phone from his age a phone call from his agent saying, Celtic won't you? He jumped in the car and came up to Glasgow. And that was how it was done. Gordon Stratton wasn't part of the proceedings. He wasn't there. And, and then that's this guy back how many years? Like I know. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that about what Stephen McGowan said that Ivan Tony was in the building and we didn't say yesterday in the Graham Spears' podcast yesterday was saying that Ivan Tony was there ready to sign for six million quid. I think it was between six and ten with add ons and whatnot, but he was there and from a financial reason it never happened. <laughs> wow. Finding that out live on air, that's quite something. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And he's tearing up trees down there, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, he is, he is. Um, but I think it's been a it's been a, a part of the approach from Peter Lowell. But obviously, he was influenced in the Paddy McCourt case by uh, the the man above him. But it's always been an issue, regardless of who the manager was. I mean, you go back to the Ronnie Dyler, for example. Uh, you know, Craig Gordon. Who signed Craig Gordon? Well, it wasn't Ronnie Dyler, was it? You know, I mean, that deal was was in place for Ronnie arriving. Um, I think there's maybe some players that he's identified. Uh, Joe Ingerberge, I, I would reckon, was a, a Ronnie Dyla signing. Uh, but there's various others who were coming in around about that time. Remember Wakaso and Tonev, and you know, there was a lot of players coming in that I would doubt Ronnie Dyla had any say in whatsoever. So 
Obviously, when you're winning, though, it masks a lot of these deficiencies. When you're winning leagues and trebles and you're going for 10 and all this kind of stuff, it's only now that obviously we're looking at it. So, Declan, I was going to bring up the Ivan Tony uh, discussion that w- was had yesterday. So he was in the building, JP, uh, and Celtic had the option to, to sign him. I think there's been comments made previously by Barry Fry saying that Celtic were messing about or yeah. delaying it. Um, and again, you know, We've also got the flip side of that. Peter Lowell's been called one of the best negotiators in European football when he was doing a deal for Dembele to go to, to Lyon. So he's obviously uh, someone who is a, a shrewd operator when it comes to financials. Of course he is, when you look at the figures uh, during his tenure at Celtic Park. That's the reason he was at Celtic in the first place. He had to come in and sort out the finances. Um, but the, the the downside of that is situations like like uh, Declan has mentioned. And again, you could bring up John McGinn. You could mention Stephen Fletcher, which might have contributed to four in a row back in the striking days. So let's talk about how um, all of these frustrations have come to a head, obviously, this season. We've seen protests outside the ground. We've seen banners being unfurled outside Lennox Town. And you've got podcasts like A Celtic State of Mind and various others who have voiced their concerns about the way that the club is run. So Celtic Shared popped up a couple of weeks ago on, on my Twitter. And you would have seen it yourself, guys. Um, you're always kind of aware of what's happening uh, in the world of Celtic. This was a new group. I learned that uh, behind that group, driving it, were certainly you know the Celtic Trust and the Green Brigade. So I was interested you know, to read their statement and see what they were all about. So they came on the show earlier on today, and they were talking about um, you know basically that are coming together of supporters so that we could have more say in how the club is run. Um, now yesterday when I was speaking to the off the ball guys last night. Um, in, in Dublin, uh, they were they were asking me about the changes at Celtic, and I accidentally said, "When the new board comes in, I don't know if that was wishful thinking. How big um, how big a change would we need, JP, for example, to get a board in at Celtic Park, board members who actually make a difference? I mean, I remember remember Sviatchenko signed, and he was paraded." At half time, wasn't he? Declan will remember because he's got a photographic memory. He was paraded at half time after he had signed. I can't remember who we were playing, Dick. And uh, I met him that day. I met uh, Sviachenko because, not because I'm part of the Prawn Sandwich Brigade, but I had been invited by a friend of mine into the boardroom that day. You know how you can do the boardroom experience. Mm-hmm. And Sviachenko, I don't know why, um, was up getting a cup of tea and I started talking to him and he, he went into this really detailed conversation about his career, about how his wife was a footballer and they were they were hoping to have kids in Scotland, which I think they eventually did. Yeah, the, yeah. Wi- the wife signed for Celtic. But he was so engaged in the conversation that presumably he'd never been introduced to Ian Bankier because I caught in the corner of my eye Ian Bankier standing with his cup of tea ready to introduce himself to <laughs> Sviachenko. But... I wasn't trying to be rude, but I was having a chat with Sviachenko and he, he, he completely ignored the chairman. <laughs> and he just stood there with this wee saucer of tea, you know, he just stood there. By the time yeah, by the time I'd finished my conversation with Sviachenko, he'd finished his tea and had a couple of biscuits, but he wouldn't interrupt and say, I'm the chairman of Celtic. It, yeah. it, was, it was that kind of presence I felt at that time. And you're looking around that boardroom and thinking, how many of these guys are on a level with Celtic supporters? It really did make me think, how many of them are powerful enough? really to be on the board of this football club that represents so many people on a world, worldwide basis um, that kind of change obviously doesn't happen overnight JP but do you think with a fresh approach and fresh ideas eventually we will see more faces within the boardroom that perhaps we can um, you know relate to yeah I, I think well one of the things that the guys were saying this morning was that um, going to meet the, uh, as as they have done, obviously they're going to meet the board after decisions have been made, mm-hmm. and then the board going, well, this is what we've done, and then like sort of you know, deal with it type of thing, and it's kind of like, nah, I think you know when you're dealing with such a large amount of people of, from so many different backgrounds and uh, so many you know people have got different financial situations, you know, I think having a having a voice and you know being respected with when it comes to decisions especially with regards to this kind of hot topic about the season ticket uh, discount which was being talked about as well you know 
I think that there has to be some sort of communication between the board and the fans and some sort of understanding over what has been done here and, you know, this the idea of it being like a donation essentially because, you know, you, me and everybody kind of knew that it was a bit of a Hail Mary that we were ever going to get back into the ground this this season or even last year. You know, I think there was maybe hope that it might happen, but ultimately the way that the world is, you just don't know. There's no guarantees. You know, people were texting me the other day going, oh, you must be so excited. Gigs will be, gigs will be back happening on the 21st of June. And I was like, I'm not getting excited about anything yet. Until it's happening, I'm, I'll not be getting excited because I can't allow myself to think like that because, mm. you know, you'll just set yourself up for a fall. And it's the same with going back to the games. You don't know when it's going to happen. You can't be sure about it. Um, but yeah, with regards to the, to the the board, that's what I I took from that with the Celtic shared guys that, that that's kind of where they are heading in terms of they want to sort of infiltrate that and sort of preempt the decisions that are being made before they're made, <laughs> so that there's like a a, a voice heard yeah. at, at that point. Absolutely, be part of that decision making process, JP, and, and you know fan representation, Declan, in your lifetime. Do you think you'll see that at Celtic Park in terms of fan representation on the board, making or helping to make these decisions? I think it's very possible. Um, you know, we need to take a fresh approach. We've, we've spoke time and time again in this podcast about communication. Fans need to have a voice at the football club. I spoke a couple of weeks ago about fans forums. We only get four of them a year. It's not enough. There needs to be constant dialogue between board level and supporters. I spoke yesterday as well in the show. We need harmony for things to work at Celtic. We need the boardroom, the management team, the fans, all in harmony, and it will work. So I think it's very possible to see that in, in the coming years. And I think Dominic McKay will certainly take a different approach of supporters to what the board have taken more recently. The Holy Trinity, uh, that's been called previously. Declan, technical director, that was Kenny Dalglish's role, wasn't it? Technical yeah. director. Now, here's a thing I asked earlier on in relation to John Kennedy. Will we see anything different? Um, and Thomas Davenport came in to say some of the Celtic players have definitely been stealing a wage. Despicable. Um, now, I'm like yourself, JP. I'll be hugely disappointed if all of a sudden some of these guys who have been playing on the par come out at the weekend and are outstanding and Eddie scores a hat-trick and all that kind of stuff. It'll be pretty frustrating for everybody involved. But sometimes they might feel that uh, a fresh approach, as Declan has been talking about, um, you know, will allow them to express themselves. But, you know, as football fans, I think you'll look at it and think you've not been trying before now. In terms of what Kennedy might do differently Francis Trainer comes in to say maybe Kennedy will have tactics that Lennon ignored potentially or pick the correct players which Lennon didn't do uh, we've also got Grant Liddell coming in to say Dembele should get a chance nope. um, now you're shaking your head do you think any anybody will come in from the cold or any of the young players might get a chance JP and uh... Possibly a, a young, maybe like a, a Henderson or a Robertson, maybe. Um, but I can't, I can't see him ripping it up and you know having this radical impact on the on the starting eleven. As for Dembele getting anywhere near the team, not not for me. Uh, I I wouldn't have said that he's done anything to deserve that opportunity. Um, the whole liking posts, you know, that are having a dig at managers or whatever. I, I'm not into that. And anybody that's, you know, getting involved in that kind of behaviour, I'm not really happy about that. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think... I, I just think... He, I think it will be a similar start in 11 to, to what we've seen. Um, and it's just about how they apply themselves. Uh, I mean, Aberdeen gave us a game. Uh, a, a couple, like a week ago or a week and a half ago whatever it was so and they'll be coming back thinking well we did it we did it once we didn't get a goal you know we've seen what Ross County can do you know we'll, we'll have another go at it although I did see that they've got that big guy Hornby's injured now for a while the big lad that they signed up front um, he looked to be reasonably good um, but Camberry was certainly in the mood and I'm sure he'll be in the mood again on Saturday so um uh, yeah, I, I just I, I just want to see Celtic win. How they win, I, I'm not really that concerned because for me, the John Kennedy era is going to be short lived. And if it's not short lived, uh, and they and they are even remotely considering him as a manager for next season, then that will put serious question marks over whether I'm going to uh, be shelling out money because 
that is not the level of ambition I want to see. I guess you, yeah, you could you could look at three different um, uh, three different options. I guess GP, you could say right, they're going to go uh, with what we have, mm-hmm. right? And I think me, probably Declan, and many others who are tuning in would feel the same as yourself in relation to right. If John Kennedy gets this gig. And Gavin Strachan's part of that setup, and maybe Stephen McManus, or you think to yourself, is that really filling you with any kind of excitement or positivity? But the answer is absolutely not. I actually think that John Kennedy will will still be at Celtic, but I don't think he should be in charge of the team. Absolutely not. You've then got the other one, the other end of the scale, I guess, which is go out like Declan was saying before. We need this charm offensive for the season ticket renewal, and you know part of that could be the high profile manager. Just because you bring in a high-profile manager, obviously there's no guarantee that it'll work. And some of the names that have been mentioned, Eddie Howe, Rafa Benitez, Roberto Martinez, they sound great, the high-profile, sexy managers. Um, And maybe, I don't even know if it's a middle ground, but the left-field option was the one I was speaking about earlier, JP, where you bring in a director of football uh, and there's a vision and the head coach maybe isn't a household name. You know, the guy that's actually developing the team that we already have, playing a part in relation to the recruitment of new players coming in, but also developing the youth, which hasn't been happening often enough over the last nine years at Celtic. And that, I think, is the third option. That vision, I think you could sell. It would be a harder sell because, you know, you you, you seen what happened when Brendan Rodgers took over. You know, the amount of fans that went to Celtic Park, I think the estimated amount was something like 13,000 went to Celtic Park to see his unveiling. You're not going to get that with a, a name that you don't recognise who's doing absolute wonders in a, an academy somewhere. Let's say like Man City, right? You know, let's say if it's Fergal Sharkey, I keep wanting to call him that, Fergal Harkin. And let's say that someone has been identified within Manchester City who obviously isn't <laughs> Pep Guardiola, um, but it's someone who's dealing in the academy setup, and they've seen something in him in relation to, as I said before, you know the Ronnie Dyla, a potential boss, someone who can develop players. Do you think that it's going to be a harder sell, but do you think enough Celtic fans would buy into that, JP? Oh, maybe not on the level of, of, of Brendan Rodgers or something like that, because that was like, you know, there's a lot of... Liverpool slash Celtic fans, you know, in the Celtic support. Liverpool's their second team, they're not mine. I got lambasted for bringing up Liverpool on a previous show when we were when I was talking about the Jurgen Klopp uh, situation and them getting beat at home off Everton for the first time in 22 years or whatever it was. Um, but I think there was definitely an element of the, the Liverpool slash Celtic, you know, diaspora uh, in terms of the support for Brendan Rodgers I don't think you can deny that I don't know if anyone's ever thought about that or not thought about that but that that for me was a, a, a factor It'd be the same if they've got a Man United manager there's a Celtic Man United connection that's Man United have always been my English uh, team I, I can't say I'm a supporter I'm a fan of, of Manchester United I'm not a supporter because I don't go to the games and uh, follow them home and away or anything like that but I think with regards to what the setup you're talking about, which would be a kind of continuation of the Ronnie Dyla experiment theme, whatever you want to call it, um, I don't really know. I, I, it's, it's a bit of a no man's land, I think, when it comes to season ticket renewals and that, because the ten in a row thing is now gone. It's now we're now at like a completely blank canvas uh, point, which. Uh, may or may not have interested managers uh, in the past. You know, anybody that any managers that are looking at the Celtic job might have been like, I don't want to get involved in that because it's just, you know, that, that that's that's a that's a that's a quest, you know, and that quest has ended sadly at, the, at this at this hurdle. Um, a lot of people thought it would end at the nine as well. People thought that we wouldn't get nine. Uh, some would argue that we haven't got nine. That's nonsense. But um, I think with this this situation and it being a, almost like a ground zero event in terms of where we are going forward, maybe there would be a lot more people optimistic about a situation like that where you bring in a director of football who has a relationship already established, somebody that they, they, they trust each other. I would certainly prefer to have that synergy between two people at the club than, than 
a director of football coming in and then them going, right, this is going to be your coach. And it's just all this kind of marrying people up, like trying to marry Dyla up with uh, Neil Lennon or, or Dyla with Roy Keane and, you know, basically matchmaking with uh, jobs, job positions. I don't want that at Celtic, you know, like how, how did, how did uh, Martin O'Neill bring in Steve Walford and John Robertson? Because he knew them and he trusted them. Yep. You know, Brendan Rodgers brought in Chris Davies because he knew him and he trusted him. It wasn't just somebody that he picked out a lineup that Celtic presented them with. Um, same with Colo Turi, he knew Colo Turi, so he brought him in. Mm-hmm. Um, and just that kind of scenario. Uh, anything where there's a synergy between a, a, a coaching staff that comes in, I think Celtic fans would have a lot more uh, c- uh, confidence in that. If if you're bringing in here's a here's a couple of guys who have done this and this and this, they might not have won leagues and you know managed national teams or anything like that, but they've done this. They've developed these players mm. who are now first team players in you know Man City or wherever. And then you go, well, these are the guys responsible for developing these players to present to a manager, Guardiola, whoever. I know Guardiola doesn't really play youth players. He actually said yesterday. How, why are you so successful? We have a lot of money and we're able to buy players. I, actually, I can't believe he came out with that. I, I read it and I was like, is he actually saying that? And he's just basically saying, oh, the reason we're successful is because we've got a load of money and we buy loads of, we, we buy loads of really good players. So perhaps Man City, not a good example of youth, uh, youth development, but um, I'm sure there's a lot of players that have come from the Man City academies that have gone to other clubs who are doing well. Well, other clubs such as Celtic. You look yeah. at some of the players that, that Celtic have brought in. You look at the, the very strong links that um, Fergal Harkin has had with Celtic in relation to the director of football. And then you look at the name that's appearing on the screen at the moment, Enzo Maresca at the moment, who's working with Manchester City's academy. So for me, I think that's where the club's potentially looking um, long term but the whole reason I'm bringing it up is you're asking about season tickets uh, you're asking about high profile managers at the moment we're talking about it on a daily basis it could just be a, a, a very quick fix even if it's a Brennan Rogers, we understood we now understand that was a quick it was a quick fix and it didn't last that long did it because there came that point where he was using us as a stepping stone to get back into the English game I think if we're going to try and look long term and there's got to be a vision then perhaps the club are looking down the route of a director of football such as Fergal Harkin alongside someone like you say that he already has a synergy with JP Um, would that be a harder sell yeah it would actually it would be a harder sell but you know, long term, would it be a better option? And again, there's a there's an argument to suggest that it might be. Why did it not work with Ronnie Dyla? Well, again, he didn't pick his backroom team. You know, he was trying to implement a philosophy and an approach to football that the uh, the senior pros didn't quite buy into. He didn't have that ability to bring in players that he wanted. So I think that there might be a, a left field approach from Celtic. And that's going to be interesting uh, because it means that we won't have John Kennedy next season or Gavin Strachan uh, for that matter. So, okay <laughs> yeah, I'm all right with that. I'm okay with that but we will be we will be back tomorrow and we will be covering the game this weekend Declan you've been on a couple of times this week always a pleasure to see you Uh, and JP always a pleasure to catch up with yourself thank you everybody for getting involved uh, via Twitter Facebook and YouTube and we'll see you again at 12.30 on a Celtic State of Mind